my name is Peter O'Donovan. I'm a principal engineer uh, at West Farmers One Digital. As you can tell by the name of the business, we are part of the West Farmers Group. We sit alongside household brands such as Kmart, Bunnings, and Target. Today, I'm going to be talking about the launch of our product, OnePass, and the challenges we faced in building an engineering capability in a greenfields environment. Here's a photo of me from a time when I had hair. <laughs> um, my background is in the platform engineering space. And outside of work, I'm an avid home brewer and guitar player. So OnePass is a subscription program that offers free delivery on purchases across our online retail stores, Kmart, Target, and catch.com.au. Our goal was to build a personalized and seamless digital experience across these three retail divisions. And recently, we launched OnePass to the public. We started building OnePass back in June 2021. West Farmer's board provided the capital, and with a very ambitious goal, we set out to launch by October. The challenge for us was that we were missing everything needed to build and launch a new digital product. It was going to be the first time West Farmers had embarked on such a journey. And I'm sure our senior team had their moment of disbelief when realizing the enormity of the task in front of them. So building a new, uh, new digital product brings a bunch of uncertainty. Trying to understand what your customers want, whether or not the product will be successful, or even if you have the capacity to launch on time. Luckily for us, our retail divisions have spent decades in building a strong customer base. We knew exactly which cohorts we wanted to target and have a rough scope or idea for what OnePass would look like. So where did we start? Well, we knew we needed people, right? People to build the product, developers, product owners, etc. But where do we find them? How do we hire them? Should they be perms, consultants? Should we par partner with consulting firms? How do we pay them? This means we need a HR function, a payroll system, a procurement team, and a corporate entity. These questions then extended into how we would host and scale our product and tackle important topics of the safety of our customers' information and the architecture of our platform. We soon realized we weren't just building a product, but an entirely new organization. We we're basically a startup in a bigger company. Um, one of our first decisions was to rent a shared office space. Our thinking was that if we were co-located, we can move faster as a team. And considering we didn't have any established ways of working, this helped a lot in the early days. Our first leaders were able to move with pace and make decisions on the spot. As we grew, having an office encouraged us to come together physically, bond as a team, and build rapport with one another. It was also important that we didn't rely solely on the office to deliver one pass. We knew that one digital would quickly scale up, and locking ourselves into a central location wasn't going to help us attract talent. Now, many of our early leaders were actually seconded from other divisions within West Farmers, and they became our stream leads. When it came to finding people to build one pass, we knew that we needed folks as soon as possible to deliver on the October deadline. But where do you find the diversity and skills and talents needed to build a new product? Not to mention the sheer number of people we required. As you probably know, the talent market is stretched, and finding the people ourselves was going to take too long. The only way we're going to do this is to partner with multiple consulting firms. Our model was that they would bring the entire delivery team, inclusive of developers, QA folk, designers, product owners, tech leads, and delivery leads. The business would focus on the what, and the teams would work out the how. We'd allocate a particular domain to a team, and that would be their sole focus up until launch. For example, customer identity. The end result looks something like this. A bunch of teams roughly the same size with similar skill sets, but focused on solving different problems. And it was at this point where One Digital truly embraced remote working. People were located across different cities in Australia, and there was no way we could co-locate. And when you take into the account the impacts of the last COVID lockdowns, we were almost forced into remote working for the better. Our next step was to enable these teams to deliver on one, on one pass. It was, the, it was important that the teams were empowered and given the autonomy to make decisions. We had CX folk mapping out our customer journeys, product owners defining the goals and roadmaps for each of our teams. Meanwhile, developers were working out how they would go about building software. There was a few key decisions to make in this area. The first one was the choice of development languages. Teams played to their strengths and typically chose one where they collectively had the most experience. In most cases, a team would represent a single consultancy, 
which meant there was a greater chance that members of a particular team had already worked together on a previous engagement. Their existing relationships and our focus to build services with speed influenced their decisions here. Now, early on, we were missing some of our technical leaders to kind of steer the teams in a strategic direction, which meant the teams didn't necessarily align on the choice of their languages. Those initial decisions aren't something you can change with ease down the track. And our environment currently is a mix of Kotlin, Golang, Java, and Node. We also have several architectural patterns on how we store state. As we continue to build one pass, we need to ensure we have the skill sets to match, which makes hiring that little bit more challenging. Now, when it came to end user compute, we wanted speed and provisioning and mobility. We made the choice to use a cloud-based virtual desktop solution for people to use as their development environment. Um, they have a low cost of provision, a fairly low operating cost, and the mobility suited our teams well. Now, you may have seen this diagram before. It represents three different forces um, in a relationship. In this case, quality, time, and cost. If I take our decision to choose virtual desktops, well, they're cheap, fast to provision, but the experience or the quality wasn't so good. Users noticed increased latency in daily operations and had difficulty in maintaining their development environments. Overall, the productivity was lower when using the solution. Now, if you evaluated this decision on its own, maybe the pros outweigh the cons, but the people affected by this choice are highly skilled consultants and are quite expensive. Reducing their productivity meant that our capacity to launch one pass was being diminished, not to mention the monetary waste and developer productivity. The pain and frustration didn't outweigh the convenience for us, and the choice ended up being a lot more expensive than it seemed. Our learning was to take to the, the time to provision the right tools for developers, even if it means shipping MacBooks across the country to them. Now, collaborating with your teams is pretty enjoyable, typically, sometimes even fun. Um, you solve problems together and forge new relationships through these exercises. When we onboarded our teams, it was critical that we defined how they would work together. Communicating across teams is hard and with our stakeholders. When you add remote working to the mix, it's even more difficult. So we wanted something that would bring us all together. Introducing Slack was a decision that panned out really well for us. It came, became our de facto tool for collaboration, announcements, celebration, shout outs, and even incident note taking. People can share their personality and interests through off-topic groups. It encourages people to participate in cross-team discussions and helps break down team silos. Huddle is my favorite feature. It's super convenient to take a complex discussion from a chat to a conversation. You get to the outcome quicker, and there's no sticky integration with other tools. But if you use incorrectly, Slack can hinder your team's ability to communicate and collaborate, and maybe have the opposite effect you're after. Most importantly, there needs to be a conscious investment in building good habits around asynchronous communications. So we set out to define our guidelines and usage for Slack. And here's just a couple of them. There's a big one pager on it. Um, most of our teams only have public channels. Everybody is welcome into these channels, but everybody respects that team's ways of working. It can be helpful to resolve issues before they happen, or provide input into an ongoing discussion, or even celebrate the success of another team member. But for this to be effective, there needs to be a level of trust or psychological safety so that people feel comfortable enough in sharing their views and opinions in an open forum. Naming conventions for channels is an easy one, but it helps to know where to find a particular team or where to get help on a certain topic. You can also identify a cohort of people. Um, it's extremely helpful when you have like external users in your Slack org. For example, we have external channels with other West Farmers divisions like Kmart or service providers like AWS or Datadog. There is such a thing as Slack fatigue. After eight months at uh, OneDig, I'm a member of about 50 odd channels, and there's this constant wave of information coming through Slack. It makes it hard to track a conversation. Threads keep those messages grouped together. It makes it easy to kind of catch up on those threads. Um, if you weren't aware, there is a thread emoji that you can apply and use to change the behavior of your team. It's happened to me many times. Um, and emojis are helpful to help define your culture. We've seen the creation of emojis for one pass um, with the squiggly little movement icons to help celebrate new teams joining um, our org. We do have some stricter guidelines or even rules. We do not and will never put customer information or PII stuff into Slack. It's not designed for that. Don't do it. Um, we do have integrations with other systems like AWS, Datadog, PagerDuty, and so forth, um, but they're just event-based, really. And no files or attachments, either. 
Here's a snapshot of our conversation usage across Slack. Um, we're still seeing a high amount of DMs, um, and our journey continues to optimize the way we collaborate. But I will make a call out that the public channel messages are higher than the private ones, so that's a win. Now, while it's not strictly an engineering topic, architecture played a major role when we kicked off the program, and it still does today. Our architects were hired before any engineer wrote a piece of code. They built the foundations for OnePass. One of the key takeaways was the governance process in making decisions that have major impacts. And one of the other talks mentioned this before. Um, we introduced our architecture decision register. It's very similar to the RFC process, where a group of people seek feedback on the decision that could impact our products, our customers, or our teams. Our first RFC was to choose a cloud service provider. Uh, there's a one-pager in Confluence, and it says, we selected AWS. No notes, no call-outs, no reflections from the conversations at that time. Um, but if I fast forward to today, our RSC process is much more robust. There's structure to it, and options are considered with much more scrutiny. Our stakeholders attend these sessions, and any contributors are required to do pre-assessments, research, proofs of concepts, and provide that data back to the group when providing their proposal. Now, over time, our architecture forum um, became overcrowded as we brought on more people. And we split out the engineering topics into an engineering-led forum. It's the same concept. We follow the same model. And it's pretty democratic at times. Um, we debate on different options and find the best solutions for our customers. This was the catalyst in forming our engineering community. It's led to the formation of community of practices where people from different teams come together to discuss and evolve our understanding of certain disciplines or technologies across the company. For example, we have a front-end cop, a back-end cop, a QE cop, and so forth. So I've touched on a few areas to give you a sense of our journey, but what is the OnePass platform? Well, as of today, our platform has been live on Kmart, Target, and Catch for three months. OnePass was designed to be a SaaS, providing a collection of APIs and event streams to support functions like customer authentication, registration, and subscription management. But unlike a SaaS, we have an intimate relationship with each of our consumers. We work closely with them during the onboarding phase and have aligned on testing strategies across the divisions to make, streamlining, make changes more streamlined. We also shape our features with consideration for their bespoke requirements. Now, being integrated into what are the probably three of the largest e-commerce platforms in Australia, performance and availability of our platform are paramount. We're constantly improving our engineering practices to ensure our platform can, can scale to the demand of these three companies. Our process, release process is aimed to shorten our lead time for change while prioritizing stability and security. In most cases, our releases are deployed to production behind a feature toggle, then toggled on gradually for certain customers or cohorts. It gives us the flexi flexibility to functionally test these systems and a mechanism to quickly roll back if things do go wrong. Now, when designing our platform, we knew that the divisions already had identity providers to manage their own customer accounts. So when it came to adding our own identity provider to the mix, it was critical not to overthink or complicate the solution. We didn't want to hinder the customer experience. We opted to federate our identity between OnePass and each of the divisions. If you sign up to OnePass today, you'll find there's an account linking process um, that creates a relationship between your OnePass account and, say, your Kmart account. Whether you're shopping at Kmart, Target, or Catch, it's the same OnePass account. Now, observability, being at an observability conference, is a key pillar of our platform. Um, and it's there to measure the quality of service we provide to our customers. We've adopted a number of SRE practices where we define SLAs and SLOs for each of our customer journeys. We then take those journeys and map them back to our systems and APIs, and then measure the four golden signals for each component. When customers encounter errors on our platform, it's important that we're able to identify where they happen and then fix them in a timely manner, which is why we chose Datadog as our observability provider. Having a central location for application logs and performance monitoring reduced our mean time to detect and our mean time to recovery for active incidents. Before we went live, we spent the time to correlate our application logs with traces from our systems. This enriches our view for identifying issues as, as they occur. Traces that span multiple systems, along with the application logs for those systems, are presented in a single view, 
meaning our customers aren't trying to piece together telemetry from different data sources. Instrumenting our services with unique identifiers gave us the ability to find individual customer interactions across our systems. Using that tracing data, we can allocate time to improve the performance of those systems when we see that we don't need our agreed SLAs with our product owners. Each team has an error budget, and they make sure they spend the time and prioritize performance improvements across that platform. One quick mention I wanted to make is our use of synthetics. We use it fairly heavily across the platform. Um, in this case, we've got a multi-stage web test. Um, there's an existing customer that goes to OnePass, logs in, goes to the members area, and then we expect to see certain content being loaded on the page at the end. If the test fails at any stage, um, Datadog notifies PagerDuty, which in turn alerts our on-call staff, and that's how we proactively monitor the environment. Now, I hope this talk gives you insight into how we've faced some of our challenges and the decisions we've made in getting one pass to the market. When it comes to product engineering, there's always a multitude of ways to solve a problem. What's important is that you celebrate the choices that made you successful and pivot in the event where you went down the wrong path. We have a rich product backlog that will extend the use of OnePass even further, and we're always on the lookout for talented people to join our team. Thank you for listening to me today. I hope you enjoyed the rants and the journey of OnePass. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Cheers.